Hello and welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, where today we will be discussing esotericism in Freemasonry with brother, worshipful brother, Troy Sprue. Ladies and gentlemen, brethren all, welcome to the Working Tools Podcast, a casual conversation around Freemasonry. First, it's important to note that our thoughts and opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our Grand Lodge or respective craft or concordant bodies. Please connect with us and ask questions via our website at theworkingtoolspodcast.com. Today on the Worshipful Tools Podcast, we'll be interviewing Worshipful Brother Troy Sprue, who is cur- the current sitting Worshipful Master of Duke of Connaught Lodge number 64, as well as the organizer of the Grand Masonic Day up in up to the north in Vancouver and the uh, Esotericism and Masonry Conference, which happens, I was going to say in Washington, but it was in Oregon last year, so here in the, here in the States, and uh, about Esotericism and Freemasonry. So uh, we have our usual panel of hosts here today with us. Um, we have very worshipful brother David Colbeth and myself, uh, Matthew Apple, here in uh, Washington. And we have right worshipful brother Trevor McCune and worshipful brother Stephen Chung up in the Grand Lodge of British Columbia and Yukon. And as I said earlier, uh, Worshipful Brother Troy, also from the Grand Lodge of British Columbia and Yukon. So welcome, Worshipful Brother Troy, and uh, thank you for coming out on our humble podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion. So uh, when we started talking about, as a group, that we wanted to do a conversation about esotericism and masonry, which I know is a topic that the several of the, the hosts, uh, past and present, are interested in, we... Uh, your name came up very early on because of your involvement with the various conferences and stuff. So um, I guess my, my first question is sort of what is esotericism? You hear It's a sort of a term you hear a lot around in some Masonic circles, but what does it kind of refer to? What does it mean? So there's, there isn't a, a technical academic um, definition of esotericism and Freemasonry falls on all four and both the minor and the two minor categories of esotericism, but primarily it's because um, our discussions and participation in our um, organization requires an initiation. So it's for a select group only, and it requires um, a mysticism uh, or a mystical worldview. And so we sort of fulfill the idea of that the academic, uh, uh, um, definition of esotericism. Uh, it's a good blanket term. Uh, I like it because it, it, it infers a third way. So rather than, you know, re- religious or theology on one hand and a completely materialistic or scientific viewpoint on the other hand, it provides sort of a, a, a third way of knowledge, uh, which I also believe that gnosis sort of falls under, which is uh, implying experiential uh, or spontaneous self-knowledge. And I think masonry is particularly good at that. It's probably the largest um, esoteric, formal esoteric organization on earth. Um, One could say that some large religious groups would also be considered esoteric or have esoteric schools within them. But Freemasonry sort of stands alone in that it doesn't it doesn't uh, organize as a religion. It's not recognized as a religion, Um, but it certainly has deistic aspects to it in most jurisdictions, although that's not necessarily universally the case. Um, there's a lot of aspects to Freemasonry that have also been adopted by, by uh, other mystery schools or esoteric uh, fields of thought um, that are much more hardcore occult or esoteric um, that utilize our system. But uh, I believe we're utilizing a system uh, from Greek mysticism that's just been sort of inherited and passed down. Um, there's no historical evidence to that, but there again, uh, as an esotericist, uh, we, we can have a mystical worldview that um, sort of precludes actual historical evidence. We can just assert something and believe it to be true, uh, though I'm not an academic, so I couldn't publish that in a book necessarily. So uh, I don't know. I saw Trevor narrow his eyes when you said that. I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Having the grand historian on when you're saying that. <laughs> it's, it, it, it has more to do with the, the surviving um, remnants uh, of the mystery schools that did exist in, in, in Greece and in Rome. Um, and they have a lot of similarities with uh, a word grip and sign, uh, giving a pass, 
um, having having a degree structure and a degree grade, uh, having um, separate classes for different groups. Um, the Pythagoreans were sort of known for this. Um, and so I, I think Freemasonry is an inheritor of that, whether it's a direct actual historical descendant, uh, one could argue one way or the other, but certainly somebody who knew something about what was going on uh, helped build our mysteries and put them together as, as they are practiced today. Excuse me while I take a drink here. Yeah, I just wanted to make a distinction here that we have, we have two lineages. We have the strictly historical documented one, which is the one that I'm more interested in, but I do not discount the tradition uh, of a lineage based on what we have acquired through our own learning and study and research that there doesn't have to have been an apostolic succession for, for us to still be connected to the ancient mystery traditions. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't uh, oppose Troy in, in taking that view. Uh, I downplay it a certain amount, mostly uh, because one can find that often finding like <clears throat> events or similarities between us and mystery schools means that we have to cherry pick those identifiers and we don't necessarily pay attention to other aspects of those mystery schools that wouldn't reflect what we were about. <clears throat> it's easy to make connections as Troy is promoting it. Now Troy does his homework, Troy does his research, but far too many <clears throat> esotericists who will call themselves esotericists don't do their homework. So it becomes less uh, what Troy is saying is the connection and more just, well, my opinion is because it feels good. Mm. And that's the, the party that I'm opposed to. The other thing I won't do is, is uh, I, I, I will claim airship, but I won't, uh, I won't claim any uh, claim airship to those traditions, but I'm not going to claim any historical authenticity or any sort of uh, authority that the craft possesses or any individuals in the craft because of those inheritances. Uh, the craft stands on its own. Um, and it, um, it does a good job for its adherence. Uh, it helps people adopt a uh, mystical worldview that is, uh, I would say, evidence-based. Uh, so it's a more scientific form of mysticism than many. Um, and it, it, it helps form sort of a moral teaching that uh, steps away from a faith-based approach where, you know, pe people are requiring a, um, you know, religious institution to enforce that sort of uh, rules and doctrine uh, in Masonry. We don't do that. You know, we, we think that doing good for, for the sake of, of doing the right thing uh, is, is evidence enough uh, of the, the value of our systems. And uh, I, I would always support that. And uh, having had the experiences I've had and experienced the fraternity that I have and being involved in, in the, the type of um, uh, peculiar practices I'm involved in, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the craft in, for these reasons, that it, it does such a good job. And I think there is good uh, independent evidence to support that it does good work for its adherents. And it's not just the, the claims of the adherents themselves. You and Trevor both mentioned this mystery schools. Um, can you enlighten us uh, who know nothing about what that might be? Uh, probably the most well-known historically is the Eleusinian mysteries, which were practiced in um, the, the Greek societies, I think post-Pythagorean, probably about 600 B.C., 500, 600 BC, maybe even earlier. Um, and they were agrarian mysteries. Uh, and I think it was a very similar to the mythology, the Persephone mythology that's uh, well known from Greek mythology. I'm not a scholar on the subject. And, but, and uh, nor am I, but I think we can go beyond that. And I think we can go back to the Egyptians and the Sumerians, but it, because it, it, a mystery by that name, because they weren't keeping the sort of records that we've been able to discover any specifics about what they were doing. Uh, anyone now can go online and found out, find out exactly what we do throughout our entire ritual. All we really know about uh, the Eleusian mysteries or, or, or the, the earlier uh, Nile mysteries um, 
is that they involve, as you say, an agrarian rebirth yeah. uh, symbolism uh, twofold. One about the changing of the seasons tied to the crops uh, and the other just uh, the measuring of time. Uh, one, I think it has been said that one of the defining characteristics of humans uh, in the animal kingdom is that we keep time. We, we know what time is. Um, and we immediately adopted that as, as a religious principle in, the, in our earliest system. So we know some of that, but any of the details we certainly don't. Well, I think the other the other thing that's important to recognize about human societies is that we place a value on life and we recognize our own mortality. And because of that, um, the uh, the particular archetypes that are celebrated in our mysteries would always be celebrated by human societies. Every human society is going to have mystery schools or celebrated teachings about these these archetypes, this birth, life, death cycle, and the roles that the, that the, I mean, uh, um, uh, Carl Jung defined these archetypes, but there's a number of different archetypal systems. One of the most well-known uh, books of images is the, is the tarot. And it, it, these archetypes are found uh, whether they directly match from society to society or not, they could be largely grouped. And uh, it's the study of these archetypes and their application in everyday life that uh, is the sort of the cornerstone of most Western occultism to this day. Um, the syncretic systems that came out of the occult revival of the 1820s, 1840s in France, uh, then popularized by the Golden Dawn and adopted by, well, just about every occult order you've ever heard of since. Now, it's all post-Masonry. Mind you, it's not Freemasonry directly, but it certainly borrows heavily from the, the mysteries that we practice. And the more Masonic degrees you take, the more you're like, well, you know, this is this is directly related to that, or or or, or this degree relates to this archetype. And um, uh, none other than Albert Pike does a, a a fairly good job in his Scottish Rite Freemasonry of describing. Um, these archetypes and ascribing them to to different tarot and different uh, different meanings, Kabbalistic meanings, uh, and the Kabbalah and tarot, at least to these um, uh, syncretists who syncretized the system together, um, find a lot of similarity from these meanings. I just happen to believe that that these archetypes exist as part of human experience. It's the nature of being a person and being a thinking being that these archetypes occur. And as Trevor was saying, you know, we, we recognize time, but it's more than that. It's that we recognize death and change in death and that we aspire to something higher than ourselves and, and beyond death. And, you know, we, we hope against hope that there's more than what's going on here. Uh, because otherwise, you know, it's uh, it's it's awfully nihilistic to just be uh, born, uh, live as a man, and then die and become worm food, and not have any continuity of existence, the feel of the continuity of existence. Wow, that was deep. <laughs> well, I mean, maybe we can get into a few specifics. Now, we know sure. in the lodge that we process... Uh, clockwise with the sun, and of course, there's a Deos, number of Deosil. meanings to yeah. that. But I've had uh, a number of brethren talk to me about how, when the candidate enters between the two pillars, that he's representing a column in the tree of life. And I don't see that in Freemasonry. I have no trouble with a brother who wants to see it that way, just don't impose that on me. But Perhaps you could speak to that and some other conflations of different traditions into masonry. Well, that's a good one. Um, that that the, the three pillars version of the Kabbalistic tree of life is probably popularized uh, most recently by uh, Alephus Levy, uh, Alphonse Louis Constant, who published a version of that tree of life. It had been known before, but I think that was the, probably the most popular publication, um, uh, one of his publications, uh, High Magic, probably about 1840, 1845. 
I'm not as familiar with his work, but uh, I believe that that's where that image comes from of the the middle pillar, the the, the pillar of balance, whereas the other two pillars, the pillar of mercy and the pillar of severity, uh, represent male and female polar opposites or the the light and dark, these sort of polarities, and that the the man standing in the middle, the the, the middle pillar, the balanced pillar represents you know a mix of both attributes. And when you lay those pillars out with the sephira of the tree of life, it does create a very uh, simple system that incorporates a lot of mystic number. So you've got you've got the three represented, you've got um, uh, three, four, and seven represented, you've got twelve represented, you've got twenty two represented, and these are all important. I can go on and on. Three and four because of the um, the elements, and five also uh, six and seven also important because of planetary magic. Seven traditional planets that would be the six traditional planets with the sun at its center, and then you've got twelve the astrological signs. Now when you total total them all up you get 20 22 and 32 so 22 being the the, the trumps of the the tarot and 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 32 being the 10 sephira and the 22 trumps of the tarot which all also represents the 22 hebrew letters you can go on and on and on about the syncresis that's put together there um the idea is to have um uh, a symbolic worldview that helps you create connection and apply meaning sympathetic meaning you might have heard the term sympathetic magic uh, most magical systems or esoteric systems have these sympathetic attributions they're not scientific uh relationships but they uh, they imply meaning uh for example uh the number seven in this system would imply the planet venus it would imply the sacred feminine it would apply uh the metal copper or, uh, copper it would imply uh, the the color green or the emerald stone it would it would imply a number of other things to do with seven and one could say the same thing about six or five or three or there's there's lots of famous uh materials about this sort of thing that uh, probably the most famous one is you know crowley calling himself the b666 crowley identified himself with the sun and um the the sephira the tifereth and and he would say he said famously in a court battle when he was being um pointed at by the by the prosecution oh you call yourself the b666 crowley's like oh six is a solar number i'm just calling myself little sunshine and and so this is an example of how th these meanings can be applied over and over with the one at the top and the 10 at the bottom and i give a long talk about the about the kabbalah and it's the kind of thing that one could go on and on and on about to people who are not interested at all and it becomes very tedious so, but uh, if you're interested in in finding out about this stuff, there's pl plenty of material published. Troy yeah. Troy is one of the most self aware esotericists. Oh, thank that you. I know. As he says, <laughs> the rest of the world is just not interested yeah, enough. Yeah. <laughs> like it's the glazing it. over. <laughs> most of yeah. I, right. I, I, along those lines, does so if one is a uh, how to phrase this? So most Masons I know. If you were to say, give that little speech you just gave on the numbers and the in the ma in masonry, in just that three minutes, you would totally they would go. Ah, that's a, you know, that's that's not, I don't know what you're talking there's about. There's so much. How could you learn it all? I was going to self-describe as a stump in that tree of life. That's about. It. <laughs> <laughs> oh think dear. Of it, think of it. I more guess my my question is 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 that mason who's not that inclined that way are they are they just missing something or is there are they not really a mason or or what's the Look, where's um, the there's a large body of people out there right. where do they fall on this uh, right so here's the thing um one this is all for to, to add meaning or to to create um uh, a, a mnemonic memory device to memorize this stuff, to remember this stuff. It's helpful to learn uh, for me as a, as a serious uh, occultist to learn the Kabbalistic tree of life, the tarot, the ast astrology, they all hang on there. So it's very convenient to have a, an encapsulated system. It's very convenient and, and safe for me. It feels very safe to be able to relate to things that way. But one doesn't have to go so far to learn that. When one is uh, uh, learning about the in the ancient work, the three, five, and seven, 
when one is talking about that, there's all sorts of meaning that's hung off that very simple uh, group of ideas. You know, you're hanging off, um, you know, uh, the, the different forms of architecture. You've got different types of, of knowledge and schooling in there. You've got, uh, you know, uh, and there's a, a long lecture in the ancient work, which in, in Canada, that's, that's the American work, the, the, the web work that um that you guys do not the english work that the canadian work is but uh you know uh, for us in the canadian work we have different groups of numbers that are important we talk uh quite a bit about um the measurements and the layout of the lodge there's some cabalistic significance there but if you're not interested in learning that stuff you know it's a, it's 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 not of any consequence it's not going to diminish your 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 learning but i've been approached by masons who are convinced that they've found uh, a numerological significance in our work. Um, in the wording of the work, they break the words down into numbers and the numbers equal this and that and everything else. Um, there was a book out a number of years called The Bible Code, which claimed to do the same thing. Uh, the, the problem is the work is not the same from place to place to place to place, from lodge to lodge, the work varies slightly. So um, it's, it's one of these things um, I think Douglas Adams talks about in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where, you know, uh, the philosopher proves that God doesn't exist and then goes on to prove that black is white and gets run over at the next zebra crossing. It's one of these things where it's only useful to imply meaning or to add meaning to the practitioner. And one could teach somebody else who's interested in becoming a practitioner and learning all of this meaning and way to imply meaning on stuff. But it's, it, it's only for the individual to use. That's, that's, do we have a saying that it's, that it's um, the deity communicating directly with your soul or the universe communicating directly with your soul? Anything you realize that way, it's for you. you know, and you could share some of it with your brethren, but you don't, you don't want to go down a rabbit hole where you sound crazy. You know, because, the, because that's part of doing group work in a group setting is so that people can keep you grounded and sane. So that you don't go, you know, uh, setting fire to public buildings, which is not a good idea. I think, I think you can make a comparison here, when you, Matthew, when you're asking if uh, uh, someone who's esoterically inclined is going to look down or, or diminish a Freemason who isn't interested in that. I think this, you see the same thing where a brother who has a good memory or defines his Freemasonry by the ability to memorize and work all of the degrees in a, in a tiled lodge. Some of them may look down and consider someone who doesn't do that as less of a Mason, where I would suggest in, in both cases, they're misunderstanding what it means to be a Mason. And I suggest that someone takes his three degrees and then goes out into the world and actually tries to put those teachings into practice is far more a Freemason who, than anyone who parses the numbers or memorizes them. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's important to remember that those of us who might study these things might find uh, a, a beautiful symmetry in the way the lodge is laid out or the way uh, we march around, um, how many circumambulations there are, how many knocks there are, how many times things are said, uh, you know, the, the numbers implied in our teachings, all of this stuff might, might, imp might further uh, dig into that candidate uh, and, and get their hooks into that candidate and therefore be practiced by that candidate. Um, and I think it's important to encourage this method of thinking because I, I believe it's why our, our material was built the way it was, was to take advantage of the way that people think that they think in archetype, they, th they tend to group like-minded things together. And there's a reason that sympathetic magic has been so popular throughout history. It's because that that's, that's how human beings behave. They find things that are similar and they tend to group them together. We like to find patterns. So, so Troy, I, I mentioned uh, our, circum, uh, our circumnavigating the lodge mm -hmm. in a clockwise solar uh, manner. Uh, you talked about uh, about the uh, the tarot or the tree of life uh, for the candidate. Can you think of any other examples of of areas where where an esotericist would find something of that in Freemasonry? Oh man, 
um, they're everywhere. Everything we do, there's no casual word or gesture in Freemasonry to somebody like me. Um, every lecture has so many different things you can hang meaning on. Um, you know, I don't know how far what we can reveal, um, the duality of the perfect Ashler, you know, of the rough Ashler to perfect Ashler. What does that represent? That re represents the hero's journey from, you know, rough hewn, um, uh, raw material to the, to the perfection that I believe is capable in the flesh. Many people would tell you it's not, but then again, many, many religions teach that, that the flesh is, is vile and to be rejected. Masonry doesn't teach that at all. Uh, masonry gives us an opportunity to do good work while we're here for the sake of it. Um, there's, there's so many things. Uh, the, the, the five stars or sorry, the seven stars that are visible in a lodge or a, a, an easy allusion to the seven planets. And that's suggesting that um, people might want to go back and look at those forgotten sciences uh, that used so much traditional astrology. And I don't mean uh, the astrological symbols. I mean that the wandering planets, the, the seven traditional uh, solar bo uh, um, uh, bodies that would travel through the through those uh, 12 zodiacal signs, they were much more important. And so, uh, so many traditional archetypes attached themselves to those seven, um, you know, and, and even seeing our square encompasses as a hexagram, which is another representation of seven. You think, well, that's six points. Yeah, but there's a point in the middle. So there's so, so many, so many things in a, in a, in a lodge um, one can contemplate. Uh, the, the use of three so often, the Pythagoreans believe three to be a perfect number and the cosmology of three, how, how um, the deity splits itself to observe itself and then uh, can only do so uh, through a mirror. So you've got, um, you've got a, a duality, you know, a, a, a one thing and another thing, but then you have the two combined to make a third thing. So there's no... Uh, and once you're above zero, you're automatically to three. You can't have one or two without three. And the mystical contemplation of the of of the the philosophical meaning of that. There's just so much, so much to contemplate. And if and if you're a, an esoterically inclined Mason and you haven't explored these things, uh, I would definitely encourage you to do so. Masonry does have a complete system of symbology in the three degrees uh, and a complete system of of practical magic that one could apply or imply from those three degrees. I think they're totally complete. I, I, uh, I often say, like I've heard Trevor say so many times, I can only count to three. So I, all I need. Yeah. I, I feel like we both scratched the surface and went really deep somehow at the same time here so mm. far. Uh, <laughs> um, so if it's, uh, well, A, uh, Troy, if you're willing to hang on for a little while longer, we, we'd lo love to uh, record a second show with you here about this topic because there's there's certainly a lot there that we've just alluded to uh, now. But I, I understand you've got some events coming up that you might like to uh, discuss briefly before we run out of time here. Do you? Yeah, a Grand Masonic Day, which is the longest running annual uh, educational event uh, in our jurisdiction, the Grand Lodge of British Columbia in Yukon. The Grand Master is going to attend on May 8th at 11 a.m. You can get your tickets on Eventbrite. You can just search for Grand Masonic Day 2021 and you will find it. Um, and I'll be posting it all over in the next little while. Uh, tickets are free with your annual subscription to the Bank for Lodge of Education and Research, which happens to be $20. So if you've already paid your dues for the year, you can get in for free. Just email me and I'll make that happen. We have a limit of 200 people available for that or 200 tickets available. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Esotericism and Freemasonry Conference, our fifth year will be sometime in October. I think it's going to be the first weekend in October. Uh, but I will be conferring with the organizing committee and getting back with a firm date on that. But please uh, stay tuned for Esotericism and Freemasonry. Uh, you can find us at esotericmasonry.com. And I, I will say I've been to that. I've been to, I guess, two of the in-person ones and, and the online one of those. And there was a, I loved it. It was really... Uh, it, you you walked out of there thinking there's so much more wow do masonry <laughs> yeah, yeah was, there's so much real. there's so much to do yeah so uh with that uh thank you worship brother troy for for being a part of our podcast today and on behalf of uh Stephen and trevor and david and myself uh well thanks for being here and thank you all for listening to the working tools podcast